So uh, <coughs> Jacob asked me to read his presentation because he thinks I read with more emotion than a computer. And then um, he's going to answer a few questions. <coughs> My name is Jacob Artson, and I am a person just like you. I am part of a wonderful Jewish family. I have a high school diploma. I vote. I like playing sports. And I listen to NPR. The only difference between us is that I communicate by <coughs> typing, and most of you communicate by speaking. Although our topic is theology and disability, I want to propose that including people with disabilities in faith <coughs> communities really isn't about disability at all. In my experience, inclusion is really a mindset that each person has dignity and value no matter who they are. In order to include people with disabilities, we have to make our communities places that welcome people of all backgrounds, whatever their gender or race or ethnicity or age or religious background or place of origin or whether they may be single or in a relationship. If we can welcome people who may be in addiction treatment or had prior gang involvement or whose political views are different from ours and people struggling with all of the many challenges that life presents, then our communities will be places that welcome people with disabilities too. I think in the end, all human beings want the same thing. We want a place we feel we can belong. I am very blessed to be part of such a community and I want to share with you some of the ideas that you can take from them. First, let me start with a text that <coughs> frames the discussion. In the book of Numbers, God instructs Moses on the first anniversary of the Exodus about the Passover sacrifice. God directs that the sacrifice be offered on the 14th day of the month in a specific manner. On the appointed day, however, a group of men approaches Moses with a problem. They were ritually impure <coughs> by virtue of having come in contact with a corpse <coughs> and thus could not offer a sacrifice. Why, these men inquire of Moses, should they be separated from the community and deprived of making the sacrifice <coughs> with everyone else? Yeah, Moses seeks guidance <coughs> from God who instructs Moses that everyone who is unable to offer the sacrifice on the originally scheduled date may offer it <coughs> one month later on the 14th day of the following month. This Pesach Sheni, as it is called, has exactly the same effect as the original <coughs> sacrifice. Pesach Sheni is a perfect metaphor for diversity. Moses could have responded by strictly enforcing God's rule and telling the men they were out of luck if they couldn't comply. But the <coughs> measure of Moses' greatness as a leader is that Moses saw it as his job <coughs> to ensure that no one was excluded from the community simply because, yeah, through no fault of their own, they could not participate in exactly the same way as everyone else. Moses knew that could not possibly be God's plan. Several years ago, my family joined a synagogue called <coughs> Ikar that has made me feel like a person, not a person with autism. My first experience there was being invited to be a scholar in residence and speak about inclusion. I was actually too scared at first to go in and read my speech, so the rabbi read it while I calmed down. Okay, Abba. By the time she finished reading, I could see that everyone was truly listening. So I was able to get in front of the group and have a discussion about what it's like to feel excluded. They were so welcoming that our family joined the synagogue. <coughs> I think it really helped that the community met me in that context because that made it possible to see past all my strange movement issues and see me as smart and spiritual. This idea is ingrained in Ikar. They work very hard to find out what each person's strength <coughs> is and find a way to put it in front of the community. Whatever contribution someone has made as a volunteer is announced in front of the whole congregation during the weekly services <coughs> so that everyone at some time has a chance to shine. In high school, I attended the teen Bible study, and one of the things that really helped me be part of the class was having a lot of study in small groups. This made it possible for me to tell my study partner my idea and have him or her share it. In addition, the teacher smiled at me and noticed my efforts to participate, so that really helped me feel welcome. Finally, I appreciated that no one introduced me as a person with autism and let me raise it in my own way. 
These same ideas are true for adult congregants, too. There are many occasions during services or lunch afterwards when the rabbis pass out a text and ask us to turn to a person next to us that we don't know to discuss it for five minutes. This has helped me engage with many different people, so when they see me on another occasion, they can smile at me instead of being put off by my unusual behavior. <coughs> another way Ikar helped support me is through a photography project. They chose about 20 different congregants and had someone take a picture of us. Then we wrote a short paragraph about ourselves, and they put the picture and paragraph up on posters in the lobby. They are also <coughs> planning to put the pictures up on our website. <coughs> A third project I participated in was a reflection <coughs> book for the High Holidays. Each year, the rabbis pick a theme and ask everyone to submit a reflection on the theme. My submission was collected in the book with everyone else's, and later people came up to me to discuss it. I also love that I was asked to submit a little statement about why I love the synagogue for the annual fundraiser. As you can see, these ideas are not unique to including people with disabilities. I think because of that, they have made me feel like a regular person, instead of trying to include me by first labeling me as a person with autism. There is no committee at ICAR for including people with disabilities. It is a committee of the whole. A few years ago, I attended my twin cousin's B'nai Mitzvah. I pray very enthusiastically, so I was quite noticeable among all the other congregants, who were sitting quietly and decorously Eva, I'd like to do a hug for Eva. Okay, you can do it. At the party that night, an educator <coughs> from my cousin's Jewish day school told us that after the service, her kids asked why I was allowed to dance oh, and clap during the service. So the mom explained <coughs> that I have I'm autism and downloaded some of my speeches and articles off the internet a hug for and, Eva. Oh, and read them with her Eva. kids. Of course, I was pleased that they found I my words inspiring, Eva. but I think the mom actually missed the main Eva. point of the question. I think the kids were asking, why can't we all dance and clap during the service? In fact, my aunt said that several of the parents commented that my dancing and enthusiasm were the highlight of the service for them. My rabbi once said that the goal of religion is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Certainly, religion has been a tremendous source of comfort for me and has also given me the hope and the structure to change my behavior and be the best person I can be. But I don't think it ends there. The lack of boundaries I have because of autism can be a challenge, but it is also a gift. <coughs> when I pray is one of the very few times in my life that I feel that my body and mind and emotions are all connected. <coughs> and it expresses itself in joyful dance that allows others to maybe get past some of the barriers that keep them from expressing their joy and spiritual connections. We all have gifts and challenges, and sometimes one person's challenge can become another person's gift. So let's all comfort and afflict each other. I think that's when God truly smiles on us. You don't want to be the guy speaking after him. And I assume we have a half an hour for the rest of this session. Is that yes? Good. OK. Um, so I never know exactly what I can add to a conference like this. I see the speakers that you've already heard, and they're extraordinary. And, um, and the ones that are coming are extraordinary, too. So, so what, what can I give you in 25 minutes that, that might alter the direction, alter the vector. And so I, I want to start with a thought. I, I want us to not think about the world in terms of us and them. Right? You all nodded, but, but I, I noticed on the program there are people who are going to tell you or have told you that it's us religious people against those secular people or who will divide those of us who know we have special needs from those of us who don't yet know that we have special needs. Right? There's any number of ways of dividing people into the wheat and the chaff, the goats and the sheep, the people who matter, the people who don't matter. It's all pernicious. Because here's the, the thing. People have used every human structure to oppress other people and to lift people up. 
People have done terrible things to people in the name of medicine and also great things. And people have done terrible things in the name of religion and also great things. So the question isn't, are you religious or not? The question is, what are you doing with your religion? And how are you bringing God into the world? Because people have been butchered and cultures destroyed in God's name by people who were full of faith and could quote the Bible very accurately. So the issue isn't yes or no. The issue is, is your faith a source of healing? Is your faith a source of joy and wonder and wholeness? Does your faith allow you to look at other living creatures and see brothers and sisters, cousins, relatives, family? And, and that's really what I want to start with. So let me just start with an observation. The Hebrew Bible, which is the shared heritage of most of the people in this room, is strangely enough, not really a book of theology. It doesn't talk about the nature of God. It spends no time at all on what God does on God's own time. In fact, the only one who gets time off in the Bible is God. The Bible, by which I mean the Hebrew Bible, is a book of values and relationships. Values and relationships. So it starts, I want to just remind you, with two overarching narratives, the rest of the Bible is just a footnote. The first narrative is that God's love spills over every boundary. That God, to be God, craves to enter into relationship. So God may be one, but one is the loneliest number. That's not scripture. And so God creates the world not out of need, but out of bounty, out of chesed, which is loving kindness. Just a word about chesed. Chesed, that, that, you know, the Bible has a hundred ways to say love. Chesed is a word that when King James Committee tried to put the Bible into English, they had to invent a new English word by running two English words together because there really isn't a concept like love that is visible in behavior. Chesed isn't just you make me feel warm and mushy inside. That's all very nice, but I'd like to see what you've done for me lately. Chesed is I know you love me because I see the way you've helped me. I see the way you see me. I see the way you lift me up. And creation is an act of chesed. The, cr the created didn't earn creation, we were gifted creation. And we're, we were created like the one who made us, not to be passive, but to spread chesed in the world. So God made us to be partnered. And the second great story that launches the entire biblical enterprise is that God cannot tolerate oppression. So that in any contest, between a pharaoh and an abominated group of outcasts, God is always, always, always on the side of the despised, the disdained, the powerless, the poor, the weak, and the invisible. Always. So in any situation, if you want a quick shorthand for where's God located, which camp is God sitting in, Ask yourself who has the power, because you won't find God sitting there. So radical love, radical justice. Now, I know there are other ways to read the Hebrew Bible, because I know that my scriptures have been used to justify empire and power and to create insiders and outsiders just as your scriptures have been used. So our question is, how can we use what we've learned about the diversity of human beings and their abilities to help God as a liberator re-enter the world, fill our churches and our synagogues and our mosques and our temples? How can we allow the recognition that we are called to be partners in that liberation. So I want to share with you 
two stories. These stories are both found in the Talmud. Um, I had a source sheet on um, Jewish sources on special needs. It's on that magical page that has all kinds of stuff. Um, at some point, you should download it and, and take a look at it, because I'm not going to read all of it, but there's some really juicy good stuff there. But I want to share with you two of my favorite Talmudic stories. And, and they're, of course, among my favorite stories in part because I'm Jacob's Abba, so I see the world through those eyes now, but in part because I teach rabbinical students. I run a rabbinical school, and those of you who are seminarians know there is no creature so arrogant as a seminarian. <laughs> they have the keys to the kingdom. They know perfectly what it is their maker wants of them, and they're only too eager to share it with you, whether you want to hear it or not. Now, there's hope. There's hope, because in about 20 years, life will have happened to even seminarians. <laughs> And those bumps and bruises along the way will humanize them. Those, those scratches and scars and broken places, that's where God comes in. Um, and, and it softens them and it makes them wise and it gives them a little humility. Um, but I catch them at their toughest stage. Young rabbinical students who have studied all the rules and are only too happy to point out the ways I violate them. <laughs> And the book that is the core of a rabbinic study is the Talmud, which I have to tell you is the world's most wondrous book. There's not a book like it. It's really an entire library. It's a shelf of books, and it doesn't fit any Western sense of how a book should read. It's really as if you just had a tape recorder running on the most interesting ongoing conversation on the planet. And then you just did a transcript of the conversations with no punctuation. That's essentially <laughs> the Talmud. And somebody put the following two stories into this book, which is the core of rabbinical education. So you take these arrogant young seminarians, and here's the story you share with them. There's a conversation going on. Uh, in, in rabbinic literature and law, as in all of the ancient world, there's a presumption that someone who doesn't have the ability to verbally speak is not legally an adult human. You understand what I'm saying? By the way, before we sneer too quickly at, at them for that, you should know that that was Western law 100 years ago. Right? So this isn't some ancient corner of the world. Um, I think in part it was the limits of technology. There wasn't the kind of facilitated technology available so that if you just look, you wouldn't know that Jacob had a mind. So the assumption is these people, used to be called deaf mutes, those people don't have legal standing. They cannot testify in court. They cannot inherit property. They cannot be legally accountable for their actions. Um, they don't have standing. So that someone anonymously is arguing about that and says, is that possible? And he says, consider the case of two people who were mute, who were the sons who were in Rebbe's neighborhood. I need to say a word about Rebbe. Rebbe is Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, who is the greatest rabbi in antiquity. He was the guy who edited the Mishnah, which is the core book of rabbinic law out of which the Talmud springs. He was the Roman appointed governor of all of Judea. He collected taxes for them, appointed the judges who served on the courts, and in exchange the Romans allowed Jewish law to be governing Jews throughout Judea. Okay? Um, so we're in Rebbe's neighborhood. and. Some say these two people were the sons of Rabbi Yochanan ben Genguta's daughter. And some say they were the sons of Rabbi Yochanan's sister. So I want to point out that the story lays it out. We don't know the names of these people, because after all, they're not really people. We don't even know whose parents they have, because it doesn't really matter, because they're not that important. Right? So I want to just remind you the context of the story. The most important rabbi in the world. Right? In, in, in a rabbinic Beit Midrash today, you say Rebbe, everybody knows who he is. You don't need to say a name for that guy. Right? So the most important rabbi ever, 
and two people so unimportant we not only don't know their names, we're not really sure who their parents are. But our story starts. So whenever Rebbe would enter the study hall to teach, they would enter and they would sit down on the floor right in front of him. And they would bob their heads and they would move their lips and they would just make sounds. Right? And everybody assumed that isn't Rebbe being nice. Look, he allows these imbeciles to sit in front of the whole class where there are serious students and he doesn't kick them out, that's so liberal, and, um, and they're not getting anything, they're just kind of bobbing their heads and making random noises and stuff, so, um, you know, that's what everyone's assuming, and you also need to know that the way a rabbinic classroom is set up, your most important student sits in the front right, and then it's in order of how your standing is in the class, with the newest or slowest in the very back. So these two deaf mutes, they're coming right into the front. They're sitting right at Rebbe's feet, and they're making these random motions and sounds. Rebbe prays on their behalf, and they are healed. I want to sidestep the issue if they needed to be healed or not. This is just for the sake of the story. Right? And it was found that they had memorized the entire halacha, sifra, sifri, and the entire Talmud. That's the story. Right? So, so if I could translate that, Rebbe uses the best technology of his dime, which is prayer, right? So he says, dear Lord, please heal these people. They're miraculously healed. And it turns out the people who everyone thought were the most empty in the room, they were the two top students in the room, right? Now, why would you put a story like that in the Talmud? You'd put that story in because in a school which values rigorous analysis and verbal excellence and intellectual sparring and a bit of showing off for whose prayers are longer than whose else's, you want to say to them, God doesn't see what you see. It doesn't appear on God's map of mattering. Right? And there's a second such story. I love this story. So Rebbe, same guy, head of Roman Judea, and Rebbe Chia, his sidekick, are traveling on a journey, you know, so they go to the provinces just to make sure that the tax collection's going fine, the plumbing is working, people are doing what they're supposed to be doing. And they come to a certain town, and they call out, if there's a rabbinical scholar here, we'd like to go and pay our respects. And so the locals say, well, there is a local rabbi here, but you should know that he's blind. Now, that's not just in rabbinic parlance a description, that's an invalidation. That is to say, he's really not worth your spending any time with. So Rebbe Chia, loyal sidekick, says to Rebbe, listen, you remain here so you don't degrade your high office. I'll go, because I'm your lieutenant, I'll pay your respects to this local guy, but that way you retain the dignity of your office by not having to meet with a blind scholar. And Rebbe insists on going anyway. And as they're departing from this blind scholar, whose name we're never told either, as they're departing, the local blind guy says, you came to pay your respects to one who is seen but does not see. So may may you merit to pay your respects to the one who sees but is not seen. I'm going to read that again. You came to pay your respects to one who is seen but not, doesn't see, so may you merit to pay your respects to the one who sees but is not seen. And Rebbe turns to Rebbe Chia and said, had I listened to you, you would have prevented me from getting this blessing. Yeah. So, we live in a world in which there are all kinds of invisible, unknown social lines of who matters and who doesn't. And nobody escapes alive. If you don't yet have special needs, you will soon enough. And every one of us hungers and thirsts for a world 
in which we can be honored and loved as we are, just for being us, not something we earn. So those of us who know we have a special need or love someone who knows they have a special need, I think of ourselves as God's advanced people. We get to be the ones who know up front that we need to do the work of building a world in which it's come as you are, in which everyone is welcome, in which there are no membership criteria and there are no standards of exclusion. And that doesn't come easy. It's really, really hard because we have all internalized a whole long list of toxic exclusionary hierarchies we don't even know about. So the only thing I want to say to you is thank you. Thank you for the work we're all doing imperfectly, haltingly, slowly, as best we can. And to say there's a lot more work that needs to be done. So I'm gonna close with one of my favorite rabbinic verses. This is from Vayikra Rabba, a 1,700-year-old rabbinic um, commentary to the book of Leviticus. Uh, the book is noticing that um, in Leviticus, any animal who has a physical imperfection, a blemish, is not allowed to be altar, offered on the altar. An animal has to be unblemished to be a sacrifice. So some anonymous rabbi comments, whatever God has declared unfit in the case of an animal has been declared desirable in the case of a person. In animals, God declared unfit the blind or broken or maimed or having a boil. But in people, God declared the broken and contrite heart to be desirable most of all. God bless you.